the bull, symbol of strength, power, and wildness that cannot be tamed. Yet here we are with a bull in a china shop, and nothing's broken. By selective breeding, by genetic manipulation, man seems to have destroyed the wild spirit of the bull. But although this bull certainly isn't behaving the way you'd expect a bull to behave, I can assure you that just beneath the surface, he's still very close to his wild ancestor. The same is true of all farmyard animals. At first glance, they might appear to be unexciting, even boring. But if you think that, you'd be wrong. It's just a matter of knowing what to look for. Pigs being greedy, for example. But are they really? And they're dirty creatures, of course. But is that true? Are bulls really aggressive towards us? And if so, why? Why do sheep flock together? Is it true that goats eat everything and anything? Why do lambs wag their tails? And what's the meaning of the cockerel's crow? Some of the answers aren't too difficult to work out. Crowing at dawn is to do with claiming territory. It's an early morning advert. Re-establishing one's living space. And of course, many other birds do the same. The cockerel is just a less melodious member of this choir. The wagging tail, however, does require some explanation. Lambs are actually wafting their scent from the glands near the base of the tail to their mother's nose. As for goats and their strange digestive habits, yes, they certainly do have amazing eating abilities, but for a very good reason. Goats have extremely mobile upper lips and very tough mouths so that they can eat their way around thorns and they have a great tolerance for bitter tastes. These are adaptations that mean that wild goats can tackle the food that other animals leave behind. Spiny gorse, for instance. In fact, any substances that are plant-based can and will be digested by wild goats. In exactly the same way, domestic goats will eat paper. But it's wrong to say they'll eat anything. They're actually fussier diners than we imagine. What may appear to be bizarre eating habits are often, in fact, just investigation and tasting. An investigative nature certainly pays off in situations where food may be hard to find. Bad table manners they may have, but they're only eating what comes naturally. But the reason why sheep flock, or cows herd, involves understanding the first of three major keys to the basic nature of our farm animals. Originally, they were all prey animals, driven by the simple necessity of staying alive. To escape when predators were about, they formed a flock or herd as a basic strategy for survival. Today, sheep react in the same way, flocking together in response to danger from the dog, the modern descendant of their ancient enemy, the wolf. You can see the same behavior today in the muskox, a wild cousin of our sheep and goats. The weaker muskox can stand a better chance of survival if they all come together in a group. Forming a defensive circle allows the herd to keep guard from every angle. All eyes face outwards to the danger. Exactly the same anti-predator instincts drive these chickens to roost not only inside, but also as high as possible. There's no direct threat, no foxes for miles. 
It's a deeper instinct that causes them to roost high up in the rafters. An instinct retained from their forest ancestors, the red jungle fowl of Southeast Asia. Here, the forest undergrowth is a dangerous place. Roosting on the ground would mean almost certain death. where jungle fowl roost are unlikely to support the weight of such a heavy python. So for chickens, sleeping on the top floor instinctively relieves those nightmare worries about snakes. And such instincts hold true even for unfortunate battery hens. These chickens have never seen a natural predator such as a fox. In fact, they've never seen the light of day. But despite this, they still possess a fascinating piece of instinctive behavior. Let's demonstrate it with this one. Without hurting this chicken, I can gently show you how birds like this can go into a trance-like state. I'm going to act the role of the predator and just hold the bird down here like this. And we should see in a moment that it will start to play dead. Now, of course, this confuses a predator. Predators like their prey to be uh, struggling and active before they kill them. So when the chicken plays dead, it can sometimes put the predator off and then the chicken is able to escape. Now, if I let go now, this chicken should stay absolutely still. And there it is, lying in a, a trance state death thing. In such a way that it could save its life in the wild. You might think that the chicken is uh, hurt or is fainted, but that's not the case at all. This is an instinctive behavior pattern of self-defense against predation. And I can prove that to you by just touching its foot and it'll jump up again. Hmm. There we are. This instinctive need to escape from predators even gives us an insight into why lambs frolic and gamble. Much of this mad play is practicing to escape and to chase, motor skills that must be learned and at the ready should they meet a predator. What about bulls being aggressive, even dangerous? Is it true? And if so, why? Surely we can't represent much of a threat to them. Maybe it's all in our imagination. The reality is that although we're right to fear bulls, today their aggression has been greatly reduced, and in any case is usually directed at other bulls. And even then, the aggressive postures are designed to avoid battle by getting the other animal to back down. Standing sideways shows your size to the other bull. Bellowing and pawing the ground emphasizes your fierceness and your strength to your opponent. 
And it's the same with bison. But when battle becomes inevitable, farm bulls will fight just as though they still have horns. And like their wild cousins, they're fighting for the control of the herd, for the right to pass on their genes to the next generation. Horns have a dual purpose, to wound, but also to parry. These bulls don't so much fight as push, but that's still enough to draw blood. Eventually, the stronger bull will win the battle, chasing off the loser or simply pushing him into touch. In extreme danger, the bull's innate aggression could save its life. Here, a Cape buffalo actually charges a lion. Maybe this is the nightmare situation that we fear, being seen by a farm bull as a predator. Like this muskox, it charges not to kill, but simply to defend itself from being killed. Aggression is also crucial to our second major understanding of farm animal behavior, the urge to form hierarchies. Cows like to sort out who's boss too. This herd of 50 has a definite peck order to be more accurate, a social hierarchy. We've labeled six of the cows to demonstrate this. The number ones, they're the dominant animals. And the number twos, they're the middle rank cows. The number threes are the lowly cows, the ones right at the bottom of the social order. When they're out and about grazing, the order doesn't really show itself. But when it's milking time and they're being rounded up and taken to the milking sheds, then they do adopt a particular sequence and then the dominance order does show itself. And when they reach a particular gate over there, they should pass through it in order. Not one, two, three, as you might imagine, but two, one, three, for a special reason. As the cows leave this field to walk down to the far gate, they immediately begin to sort themselves out. A dominant number one passes one of the lower number threes. A middle number two makes its way to the front. Whilst number one continues to make its way into the middle of the herd. Now nearing the gate, the order is sorted out. And it is the number twos that pass through before the dominant number ones. As any soldier will realize, the front line is not a very safe position to occupy. If we speed things up, we'll see that the most dominant cows allow the lower ranks to pass through before them to test out the ground. They pass through in the safer middle herd position. Whilst the lower rankers straggle through at the end, the most vulnerable position should a predator give chase. Today, this sorting out of order probably does little more than stop the traffic. But in the wild state, it could mean the difference between life and death. Death for the most vulnerable bison at the back of the herd, life for the ones in the middle, safe from attack. If new cows are introduced to an established herd, the hierarchy becomes upset. To be accepted as a member of the herd means fighting for a position. Age, strength and sexual condition can all affect the final outcome. Chickens, too, know their position within a group. They have a peck order a term which means exactly that. In an enclosed space, like a hen house with food to squabble over, this becomes very apparent. Such pecking can be pretty fast, so labeling the chickens with colored leg rings gives us a fighting chance of working out the ranking. This fight is between red and green. They seem quite evenly matched, but red finally gets the better of green. But green's not chicken and sees off yellow. And yellow, in turn, asserts dominance over blue.
the odd peck is exchanged to reassert the order, which seems to show blue as the most henpecked, followed by green, then yellow, with red occupying centre stage, the most dominant bird. In the jungles of Asia, the laws are just the same. The cockerels are never henpecked. They're dominant over the females and have a separate male peck order. So fights are usually between birds of the same sex. The hens, however, must protect themselves and their young from intruding males. The jungle floor can be an arena of outright battle as well as a dance floor of subtle behaviour. It's holding territory as well as group position that are decided by this tough but necessary means of keeping the peace. Cattle, hens, goats and sheep, domestic or wild, they'll all fight for a place in the hierarchy. The third major urge that drives our farm animals to behave the way they do is the maternal instinct. The lamb's bar is, fairly clearly, a contact call between mother and offspring. She can smell her lamb and see it, but she needs to hear it as well. When danger threatens, she needs to have the lamb by her side. The maternal instinct only works for your own, not somebody else's lamb. But it's when you see sheep in their wild surroundings that the importance of the lamb's bar becomes more obvious. No open fields here. In broken, rocky terrain, the ewe may not be able to see or smell her lamb, but if she can hear it, she can respond and bring the lamb to her side. When piglets are born, the order of birth will determine those most likely to survive. In fact, in modern farms, they'll almost all survive. But the piglets are driven by an urge genetically inherited over thousands of generations from a time when they were wild animals. The first piglet makes not for the closest teat, but for the one nearest the mother's head. It's an unobvious thing to do. It's much farther to go. But the piglet is wise in its choice. That teat will yield the most milk, and it, in turn, may become the strongest of the litter. Other piglets follow the same instinct, and much squabbling goes on to get the best teats. Within three days, the sucking order has been established. Later, at three weeks of age, this teat order is still exactly the same and will remain unchanged for the rest of the sucking period. A difficult point to prove with eight very similar piglets, but with some careful observations at mealtime and a set of sticky numbers, the proof of the eating can be revealed. And there's number five, a poor entry with bad positioning, closely followed by two, who's made a good, accurate start. Oh dear, number six has got completely the wrong end of the pig. And number four is out. What a setback to some promising suckling. But he's making a comeback. It's a tight squeeze, two-tiered, but they finally settle down in order. In spring, before the hay crop is cut, the knowledgeable farm watcher might come across calves 
hiding in the long grass. The remarkable behaviour going on here is a key to why we domesticated the most successful of all our farm animals, the cow. The ancestors of today's cows bore calves that weren't fast enough to run with the herd. So they hid their young from predators, returning, probably at dawn and dusk, to feed them. Even today, the instinct remains. But it's an instinct that was to have far-reaching consequences for man. The wild cow had to be able to eat grass, process it, and store it for long periods, until she could return to suckle her calf and man has cashed in on that storage capacity, turning the small udder of the wild animal into the unnaturally large udder of the modern cow. The milkman has taken the role of the calf, and we now drink the milk. Maybe the twice daily milking routine on modern farms is an echo of the dawn and dusk feeding when the wild cows returned to feed their hidden calves. So man has selected animals for his farms based on his ability to exploit their behavior. And then he's genetically manipulated them to suit himself. So we can change the shape and color of our animals, but if we try to suppress their wild behavior, those instincts will re-emerge in all kinds of unnatural ways. Pigs with their sensitive noses will still root on concrete, going through the motions of turning the soil. In a woodland, such activity uncovers food, shoots, nuts, insects. Feeding for any pig should be an ongoing event seven or eight hours a day being spent simply in the pursuit of nourishment. It's hardly surprising that modern pigs act greedy now that their food menu has become so drastically altered and they're forced to eat at set times. Feeding is now a highly computerized event. The volume of food eaten and the speed of its consumption is further increased by the unnatural closeness and vast number of other diners. Today's modern pink pigs need to mud bathe even more than their wild relatives. With lighter coloured skin and less protective hair, they must avoid overheating in the sun. Once the mud pack is applied, letting it dry in the sun helps to cool the pig and also to kill its parasites. So pigs are only dirty through necessity. And the phrase sweating like a pig is far from true. The only sweat glands they possess are on the ends of their noses. Such dirty habits are simply a way to keep clean. The dust bathing that jungle fowl and chickens practice is a dry cleaning way of keeping the plumage in trim. Sunny conditions trigger off this frequent behavior. In a cage, there's no space or dust, but they still go through the ritual movements of dust bathing. This metal environment is a million miles away from the leafy outdoors. Here, chicks learn to feed from watching their mothers. These chicks have never seen an adult, let alone fed naturally. No longer is a chicken considered as an animal. It's simply a part of the machinery of egg production. Back 
in the wild, the mother boar will very sensibly build a nest in which to give birth. Today we may have changed their appearance into fat, airless, pink pigs, but the instinct to nest build has hardly diminished. Give a sow the smallest quantity of bedding material and she'll endeavour to follow the maternal programming of her genes. Wild boar piglets are born to the dangers of the forest, but in the comparative comfort of their well-appointed nest. The factory sow has a farrowing crate. Unable to nest build, she acts irrationally, and even attempts to go through the ritual grass-gathering movements. Given straw, the old instincts are catered for, and the sow is more contented. The farrowing crate may mean no more squashed piglets, the farmer is certainly doing his best for them, but at what price for the sow? This must be as far as you can get from a factory farm. These wild boar aren't really wild boar at all. They're modern versions of Iron Age pigs with the appearance of wild beasts, but the temperament of domestic pigs. And the system works. The animals provide food for us, but they look, live, and behave like wild animals. Now, it's quite easy for us to change the appearance of animals, but it's almost impossible to alter the instinctive urge they have to behave like their wild ancestors. And those fascinating behaviours are a sign of the way they want to live. And if we can respond to those signals, as is happening here, we should be able to provide them with living conditions where we can farm them, but they can express their natural wildness. 